It's Saturday morning cartoons, and I'm dressed up as my uh, one of my cartoon characters, the Rosicrucian Babylon. Uh, it's it's rainy and cold out there. I uh, I know this looks like I'm wearing it for dramatic effect, and perhaps I am, but it's also it's just colder and shit, and. Uh, the temperature just went down like 30 degrees between yesterday and today, kind of. Uh, it's kind of crazy. And I've just been for uh, a walk to the to the coffee shop. I wasn't dressed quite like this, but pretty much the same. And um, I've sort of got wet socks and <laughs> you don't need to know. Anyway, it's Saturday morning cartoons and I want to share uh, with you uh, uh, an excerpt from a speech that I gave at a uh, esoteric conference uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and it, it was uh, uh, something uh, that was organized uh, uh, not by any particular uh, order or organization. I guess perhaps uh, uh, we could loosely say a confederation of Freemasons. Uh, and esoteric uh, uh, fellow travelers. And uh, I called it uh, Lon's Rosicrucian Adventure, uh, an aging magical mystery school veteran speaks out loud about the rewards and relevance of occult orders in the 21st century. So uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I've edited it for today's uh, uh, cartoon, <laughs> but I'm going to share it with you right now, if you don't mind. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this historic event for inviting me to come and say a few words. I have to, I, you always got to start with a joke, even with serious folks. Okay, so this is the same joke I start with every time, and it always gets polite fake surprise giggles, okay? And I'll do it once more for you. I have to confess I'm a bit intimidated by the company. This gathering is more or less a who's who of 21st century occultism, which is it's exactly true. I feel sort of like the fourth wise man whose gift to the baby Jesus was a honey-baked ham. Brr -bum. But as low as I may be on the Illuminati totem pole, there is one thing that I do have in common with each of you. I'm a survivor. If I've learned nothing else in the last 50 years, I've learned that survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. We're all survivors. And oh, the stories we could tell each other. Our lives are not like those of our fellow citizens. We talk with angels. We banish demons. We walk with gods. We dress up in colorful robes and sashes and headpieces. We allow ourselves to be tied up and blindfolded and pushed around the room while being yelled at by someone speaking with a phony English accent. We strut around in circles in the middle of the night in ill-lit rooms. We wear swords and carry lances and queue up patiently to stick our hand over a fire and sniff a rose. Sometimes we even crawl in and out of coffins. Year after year we do these things and oh, so many more quaint and curious things. We do it because we love it. We do it because we really do talk with angels. We really do banish demons. We really do walk with the gods. Magic is my spiritual way, my chosen path to enlightenment. 
But magic isn't my life. I use it to make my life magic. I've got closets and chests full of bizarre and colorful robes and togas and cords and crowns and miters and masks and wands and staffs and banners and jewels and pine cones on sticks and swords and daggers and chalices and thuribles and incense burners. I use these things to perform magic, but they're not my life. I use them to make my life magic. And I have books. Boy, do I have books. And you do too. Strange books. Books that would scare the crap out of any self-righteous, God-fearing, scripture-quoting, family-valued, born-again, burn them at the stake, the Bible said it, I believe it, that settles it, forest, raping, ocean-killing, land-poisoning, hummer-driving, seal-clubbing, Jesus has a plan for your life, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, George Bush-stickered, small-town, southern sheriff. As a matter of fact, if Constance and I didn't live in Southern California, which we did at the time, where most of our neighbors have started their own religions and are even wilder than we are, I'd keep the entire library hidden from view. I study these books, but they're not my life. I study them to make my life magic. I'm also U.S. Deputy Grand Master of Ordo Templi Orientis, a magical order I've served for, at that time, 33 years and now 50 years coming up. I am Archbishop of my church. I'm an initiate of a little Golden Dawn group and a 32nd degree Mason. I could add a few more things <laughs> since this was written. These are my holy orders. But they're not my life. They help me make my life magic. I celebrate the seasons with my pagan and Thelemite brothers and sisters. I participate in the rites of Eleusis and all kinds of indoor and outdoor rituals. As a priest, I celebrate the Gnostic Mass. And for 28 years, eventually 40 some years, I've taught a weekly magic class. I write books and articles and screenplays. I hold classes, workshops, and seminars all over the world. I've officiated at over a thousand degree initiations. These are magical things I do, but they're not my life. I do these things to make my life magic. I don't have to tell you the initiate's life is not easy, but it's simple. All you have to do is survive. Survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. And once we set our feet upon this path, the cosmos wakes up and says, okay, kid, survive this. Oddly enough, many of our tribulations come not so much from the haters of magic but from those who have made magic their lives. From those who profess to love the same things we love. From others who strut around in circles in the middle of the night in ill-lit rooms. An ancient text found in the archives of the late Rabbi Lama Ben Clifford reveals it has been so since time immemorial. O thou who meetest jerks and assholes, rejoice because of them, for in them is strength, and by their means is the pathway open unto that light. How should it be otherwise, O man and O woman, whose life is but a day in eternity, a drop in the ocean of time? How, were the idiots not many, could thou purge thy soul from the dross of earth? Is it now that the higher life is beset with dolts and morons? Hath it 
not ever been so with the sages and hierophants of the past. They have been ignored and insulted. They have been beset by committees and inquisitions. They have been stalked by psychopathic disgruntled former members. They have been tormented by psychotic megalomaniacal rival sages and hierophants. Yet through this all has their glory increased. Rejoice, therefore, O initiate, for the greater thy trial, the greater thy triumph. And survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. Obviously, the title of my talk, my Ro Rosicrucian Adventure, is a shameless rip-off of, of Francis Rigardi's tidy little book. It was my great privilege to have known the great 20th century magician and Rosicrucian, Dr. Francis Israel Rigardi. As we all know, Rigardi was Aleister Crowley's personal secretary for a number of years and went on to be one of the most respected and controversial spokesmen for the magic of the Golden Dawn. For many of us in this room, or many of us in this room are here because of the words of Israel Rigardi and the work of Israel Rigardi. Francis was a regular guy, unpretentious, charming, and very funny. At our first meeting, we discovered that we'd both been members of the Masonic Boys Organization, De Molay. He popped out of his chair and gave me the secret grip. I turned and whispered the secret word of a De Molay degree in his ear. He told me he had forgotten it. I, of course, replied that I'd have to kill him. In the course of our conversation, we discovered that we both had many encounters with people who claimed to be the reincarnation of Aleister Crowley. I talked about this in the last couple of days. In the months to follow, we made plans together to publish them in a book which we were going to call Libra Nuts. He died before the project got too far. Almost immediately after Rigardi died, letters and testimonials started to pour into magazines magical journals and newsletters from people wishing to honor the memory of this formerly living legend. Some of these people knew Rigardi well. Others met him once or twice. Some had corresponded with him. Some of them wrote him, but he never wrote back. And some of them always planned on writing him, but never did. All these letters had one thing in common. They were from people who wanted you to know how much Rigardi loved them. The letters went something like this. And this, I'm exaggerating in this. This is satire. But they were pretty much like this. Francis Rigardi, I called him Francis, those... Uh, of us who he respected as equals were allowed to call him Francis. Francis really loved my self-published biannual quarterly newsletter, Magic Beans. In his last letter to me before his death, he wrote, thank you for sending me the latest issue of Magic Beans. I assure you, dear boy, I will waste no time in reading it. Perhaps the best example of, uh, uh, is an article that first appeared in Meslem magazine. And I, I, I wrote a goofy thing as, the, as a guy who called himself Frater Stonehenge Equinox. I'm not going to, I shared that with you a thousand times here, so um, I'm not going to share it again. But it was, it was like that. This is how much Rigardi loved me, you know, in his last letter he he prophesized his own death by saying, it'll not be necessary for you to ever contact me again. Uh, anyway, we've all met magicians like Stonehenge Equinox, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, most of us were magicians like Stonehenge Equinox. 
and there's probably a little Stonehenge equinox left in all of us. Who are Rosicrucians? Am I a Rosicrucian? Are you a Rosicrucian? You know, I think that as long as I don't claim to be a Rosicrucian and you don't claim to be a Rosicrucian, then there's a chance we might both be Rosicrucians. As a naive young mystic, I imagined a group of spiritual adepts, masters of the magical arts, super cool men and women pledged to the spiritual advancement of humanity, men and women living all over the world but joined together to form an invincible magical network, extraordinary individuals who had gained enlightenment and who are not afraid to use it. It is to this magical order we pledged ourselves in our youth. We placed our hands on the sacred symbols and dedicated our lives to becoming masters of our destinies, masters of our souls. Then as, this, uh, as if this oath invoked a terrible god of bait and switch, we found ourselves for the next season of our lives focusing the laser beam of our one-pointed will not upon the process of becoming masters of our souls, but upon the process of becoming masters of our lodges. After that, we absorbed ourselves with becoming leaders of our orders. Almost overnight, we turned from wide-eyed acolytes to bleary-eyed cat herders, carpenters, policemen, and accountants. Sure, neophytes consider us adepts. They come to us for guidance and instruction and inspiration. But where does the adept go for the same things? As a cynical, middle-aged, and now aged magician, I realized that this body of Rosicrucian adepts was a fantasy. That people, no matter how magically educated and trained, are still just flawed human beings, even the great souls. Imperators abscond with dues and move to Endora. Hierophants hit on your wife. Magi use sleight of hand. Oaths were written by schmucks who could never in good conscience utter them themselves. The light of the mysteries turns easily into the dark night of the soul. How many of our brothers and sisters have slipped away from us in that dark darkness? But we have survived. Because survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. And for those of us who survive, the dark night of the soul does indeed break forth in a golden dawn. There comes a time in each of our initiatory lives when we are inwardly informed in no uncertain terms that no matter what may happen in the future, we will always be linked to the great order. That doesn't mean we can't resign or quit or go inactive or be expelled from this or that organization. Of course we can. It simply, meaning, it simply means that we've been initiated, truly initiated. And no matter what the objective circumstances of our lives may be, nothing can take that initiation from us. We are changed. No, more than that, we have begun. And we have begun an unstoppable process of changing that will excuse me, eventually will take each one of us to the summit of spiritual evolution. 
no matter how much we screw up, no matter how many toes we step on, no matter how many hearts we break, we have been initiated, we have begun. So remember, my dear brothers and sisters, when thou art a jerk and an asshole, pray that your brethren will rejoice because of you. Because of you will they become strong. Because of your embarrassing example will a pathway be open unto that light. How should it be otherwise? How wert thou not at times a complete idiot? Couldst others purge their souls from the dross of earth? Is it now but the higher life is beset with buffoons such as thou, such as we? Nay, if it has ever been so with the sages and hierophants of the past, they have been ignored and insulted. They have been misunderstood and tormented by self-centered fools just like us. Yet, because of fools such as we, their glory shall be increased. Rejoice, therefore, O initiate, for you are not alone. Rejoice in the sure knowledge that you are just as big a pain in the ass to your brothers and sisters as they are to you. We need each other. We need each other to survive. For the, in the great order, the greater our trial, the greater our triumph. And survival is the first and last ordeal of initiation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And that's the end of our Saturday morning cartoons. We'll see you tomorrow, hopefully, for Sunday School. Until then, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other and survive. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.